Hello everybody. Um, it is now uh, 11 o'clock uh, Central Europe time and we are now starting this webinar about motorists as vulnerable road users. Uh, my name is Martinette Ken. Uh, some of you already know me as I am uh, the coordinator of the European Road Safety Charter. Um, welcome to this very first online workshop organized by the European Road Safety Charter in collaboration with the European Transport Safety Council. You have been more than 100 to register for this webinar, so this shows a high interest for the subject. And before introducing our speakers, I would like to um, give you a few tips on how you will be able to interact with them during this session. So, um, on the bottom left side of your screen, you dispose of a chat session, section, sorry, um, where um, you can post all the questions that you may have. Nicolas Standage, my colleague from the European Road Safety Charter, will be the, today the moderator of this chat. He will take note of your questions and forward them to the speakers. And at the end of this workshop, we'll try to respond to as many as possible of your questions. Uh, in this chat uh, section, you will also publish a few multiple choice questions that will help us to know you better. So you can respond to them by clicking on the button that is just under your username on the screen, the right hand uh, button. Uh, if you click on it, you will see that you have several possibilities with letters, so you will just have to choose uh, the letter that corresponds to your response. Um, for example, right now, and Nicola is going to ask you a question about from which organization you are coming from. So if you are from an enterprise, you can just uh, click uh, uh, A for company, enterprise, B for public authority, C for association, and D for uh, any educational organization. So you will have a few minutes to respond to these questions. Meanwhile, I'm going to introduce our speakers of today. So, um, first of all, um, well, today Veneta Vasileva uh, will represent the motorcycle industry. And unfortunately, Antonio Perlo has not been able to join us today, so she will uh, speak uh, for both of them. Then, uh, Jua Kulmala will speak uh, from his office in the Finnish Transport Safety Agency. And John Chatterton Ross is with us today and is from the International Federation of Motorcycles, so he will be able really to uh, make us uh, know the voice of the users themselves. But for, first of all, um, Maria Teresa Sanchez-Legas will explain the position of the European Commission on the subject. Um, Maria Teresa Sanchez-Legas is project officer in the DG Move and the DG uh, Transport and Mobility. And she's in charge of the European Road Safety Charter, uh, among a lot of other projects. Uh, um, so, Mrs. Sanchez-Legas, uh, I know that vulnerable users are really um, one of the priority of the European Commission for the next decade. Uh, thanks, Martin. And I want to say welcome to all the participants in this webinar. It's an uh, experience that we, we've seen it would be very interesting. And this should be also a kind of pilot experience. And if we've, if we've seen it's something that is interesting, most probably we are going to try to use it on the, on the next phases of the, of other projects and particular on the charter. So, um, you say that for, for the commission is a, is an important priority, the vulnerable road users. Of course, it's a priority for the commission. And it was a priority already on the on the previous road safety action plan that finished in 2010. And now we have started with a new road safety action plan from 2011-2020. And there is one main objective that is to, um, to reduce the number of fatalities in a half, but it was the same objective on the previous, on the previous uh, plan, and it was one of the main objectives of the charter. 
And uh, there we have defined some specific objectives. And one of those was the uh, vulnerable road users. Vulnerable road users mean the users that uh, because of the fitness or because of the transport that they use are more vulnerable than the others. And uh, for this reason, the motorcycles is one of the vulnerable road users in a traffic in which the majority of the other uh, vehicles are cars, the motorcycles are more, more vulnerable. So we have time to introduce one, one, uh, one objective in this road safety action plan for them, because we think it's one of the main groups that we have to touch. Um, but in that particular case, in that webinar, we don't want to, to go to see which are the different directives, proposal of legislative actions. Because we think what is really important is that all the society, all the intervenients do the best that they can do it. So it's not necessary to wait to see which are the rules or which are the legislative actions. It's really we want to, 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 to have all the intervenients, the civil society, the companies, and everyone to try to make actions to improve the safety on the roads. So um, saying that this vulnerable road users um, strategy is not isolated. So you can make many different actions to try to increase safety. You can use also the possibilities on the ITS. You can use also the possibilities to um, on the mobility plans in urban areas. You can use many of other possibilities that is cross um, cross around all the different policies. And we thought the road safety charter is one of the possibilities that people that are not professionals on the road safety subject can do different interventions on the health sector, on the education, on the training, to try to have uh, an increase on the safety, if I could say. So try to, to have a better and better roads and safer roads. So. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Teresa, for this introduction. Uh, it's true that uh, a lot of our public that have registered today uh, are uh, members of the European Road Safety Charter, so they are completely and directly involved in this prevention. Um, now, I would suggest that uh, we look at uh, the results of our first poll. And um, just a second. No? So um, some of you have not responded, but we can see that the ones have, that have responded are from uh, a from uh, companies and also from association mainly. So this is quite a reflect of our signatories in the Road Safety Charter in the European Road Safety Charter. Well, now uh, for those who have responded, uh, don't forget to go and um, delete your your answer because if not, it will be taken into account for the next questions. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker, so Veneta. Uh, Veneta uh, Vasileva is from ASEM, the Association des Constructeurs Européens de Motocycles. Motocycle. So in, in, in English it would be uh, the Association of the European uh, Motorcycle Industry. Uh, I must say that ASEM has been uh, one of the first signatory of the Charter and is one of the few organizations that have renewed twice their commitment to the Charter. Also, a lot of uh, uh, your national members, Veneta, are part of the Charter, also have joined the initiative. So I think this shows a real commitment of uh, the motorcyclist industry um, towards uh, improving road safety. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, safety is a uh, top priority for the European motorcycle industry and we are very grateful for this invitation to take part in this event today. I would like to share what are the current challenges and the future perspectives in terms of PTW safety and this is the industry position. So just um, a show introduction, a small introduction, the motorcycle industry in Europe 
It's the association which represents uh, 13 PTW manufacturers and we have also 17 national associations also representing smaller manufacturers and suppliers. In Europe we have more than 33 million users in European Union and uh, what is very important is the fact that more and more citizens are using PTWs for commuting. And the, uh, the second fact is that there is a great disparity between EU member states in terms of safety. But this is applicable not only to PTW safety, but for overall users. What is uh, very important to underline also that um, the PTW sector is uh, really uh, represents a great diversity of vehicles, of owners and purposes, because some people they use the, these vehicles mainly for commuting, other mainly for leisure, and some of them for sport. But all of them are indeed vulnerable road users because they are not protected by car drivers because of the specificity and the specific characteristics of the PTWs. It is also true that um, the fatalities rate of the PTW riders are not decreasing at the same speed as all road users and mainly car drivers. But what is also true and very important to understand is that uh, for the last 10 years the number of uh, the PTW fatalities is con continuously going down and it is the share of the PTW fatalities which is increasing in the transport mix mainly because of the best and uh, good results of the car sector. So what ASEM is uh, doing, as I already mentioned, safety is a top priority for our members. And uh, we have started with um, mates. I think more or less more people who are working in this domain know this study. This is the in-depth investigation study on motorcycle safety, which uh, was accomplished in 2004 with the support of the European Commission. And it is still the most um, important uh, in-depth study available nowadays in Europe. Based on the conclusions of MAIDS and the results, which helped us to better understand the accident causation, we then uh, created our own safety plan of action. And uh, this plan of action is built upon the integrated approach. The vehicle factor, the human factor, and the infrastructure. And why we do so? Because it appeared that, according to the main results, in 87 percentage of the uh, all accidents, the main causation factor is the human error. Of course, the infrastructure is also contributing, and in very few cases, it, the problems with vehicles. So we do believe that. Uh, the improvement of PTW safety, which is one of the main targets of the European Commission for the coming decade, is the integrated approach. And for example, we do believe that uh, training could play a very, very important role. That's why we have uh, our position that we are in favor of uh, mandatory training for all riders. And we thought that uh, this uh, could be really improved with the uh, implementation of the third driving license directive. Unfortunately, many countries decided to go for tests rather than for training. We understand that it is quite complicated process, but we do insist on this and we still have this position that uh, mandatory training for all riders, including uh, novice riders, newborn riders, which is a group at a very, quite high risk nowadays. And then another issue is also the training of drivers, because once more MADES showed us that uh, the perception failure of the car drivers is the main reason for the motorcycle accidents, meaning that very often car drivers do not see or they do not expect the PTW rider. And we believe that this should be also part of the training of drivers, which would complement the, the improvement of the PTW safety. 
Of course, all this is uh, associated with some awareness campaigns with uh, enhanced enforcement and then working on infrastructure and last but not least then working on vehicles uh, having vehicles with improved safety features research and this is what the manufacturers are doing actually uh, very briefly I will also now say what uh, the the ASEM members are doing about uh, the improvement of the vehicles as uh, Martin already mentioned, ASEM committed uh, already in 2004 to introduce advanced braking systems on the street motorcycle models. And since the first target was uh, reached, achieved, then we renewed our commitment, extending the coverage to 74 percentage by 2015. And it appeared that this commitment now will bridge towards the upcoming type approval EU legislation, which requires mandatory fitting of advanced braking systems from 2017 for all registrations. Another commitment from this industry is the commitment on automatic headline on, which was made in 2003. And we do appreciate that it has been enshrined in the upcoming type approval legislation, which will apply from 2014. Uh, the industry is working very actively on this aspect because, as I mentioned, the conspicuity is one of the main factors for the PTW safety. In terms of ITS and motorcycles, there are already some driver assistance systems or rider assistance systems on the market, uh, but um, the industry is confronted with many technical many challenges for putting into place the advanced rider uh, assistance systems, which is associated with the specific characteristic of the PTWs because of the dynamic, uh, because of the different sizes, because of uh, many specific uh, features. Very often uh, people, they tend to perceive the PTW market as one uh, market, but uh, the reality is that the sector is much more diverse than the, the car sector, which uh, automatically uh, makes uh, the, the the implementation, the configuration of new safety features much more complicated for the manufacturers. But of course, they work very intensively on this issue because we believe that uh, the cooperative systems could play a really very important role and could contribute to the improvement of PTW safety. Once more, uh, made show us that uh, in 40, in 54 percentage of all PTW accidents occur at an um, intersection, and this is exactly where the V2V or V2X can potentially address this issue. And uh, it is clear that uh, V2X will progressively appear in cars in midterm. And motorcycle safety could benefit from in, being included in this connected world. Uh, just a few examples of uh, another uh, safety activities apart from the vehicles. As I mentioned, uh, we are very much in favor of um, mandatory training and we have many manufacturers who are providing training as, uh, for example, a voluntary training for riders who would like to enhance their safety skills. And we put a lot of um, accent on the hazard perception, not only on the technical skills, how to ride a, bicycle, uh, a motorbike, but rather to be aware about all the road safety um, risks. Then uh, we had, uh, for example, one very big online campaign showing all, all the hazards related to infrastructure. We implemented a very big European campaign on protective equipment for riders. We continue working with mates. We implemented also a big helmet campaign. 
And uh, another example is the European Safer Urban Motorcycling Project. This was a project uh, led by four cities, Rome, Paris, London and Barcelona. Uh, in which ASEM was very actively participating with other manufacturers and some universities. And I just wanted to show a few examples of uh, concrete outcomes of this project. Like in London, for example, after two trials, the city has decided to, to allow PTW riders to drive in the bus lanes, in some bus lanes in some parts in London which contributes to the smooth traffic and improved journey time reliability for riders on the network. Another example is the introduction of the infrastructure trial in Barcelona, 30 kilometers per hour uh, zones, which had a very positive impact on the accident trends. Another uh, main legacy of the project is the action pack, which is very easy to use toolkit. It is uh, created specially for the city authorities who would like to improve PTW safety and to take advantage of all the mobility advantages offered by PTW. So it is very important to integrate PTWs in the mobility uh, plans of the cities and uh, this has been translated in several languages and it's available also on the Commission on the DigiMoof website. Uh, for example, the city of Rome uh, has created uh, a new road safety urban plan in 2011 and for this part which referred to the PTW safety, they used this action um, pack and the good practice guide which contains more than examples of more than 150 good practices from all over the world. So I would like to invite uh, people who are participating in this uh, conference and who work in different city organizations or uh, associations that they could really have a look at the ISM website where they could find videos about different initiatives and trials implemented by the cities. They could find the action pack and the good practice guide which will be translated next year by the European Commission. At the end I would like to finish my presentation by saying that uh, that's true that the PTW, the motorcycle industry is doing a lot of efforts and a huge work has been done to improve the safety of the vehicles, but uh, it is not possible to improve safety alone. So we really need the support of both stakeholders and there is a need of a shared effort in order to create a favorable environment for PTW safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venita, for this very complete uh, presentation. Um, now we are going to see what have been the response of um, our last poll. Let's see, Nicolas. So um, I must say that uh, most of the people that have responded uh, think that um, the main cause of the accident are the user's behaviors. Um, I remind you that it's important for you to respond clicking on the icon just under your username because if not your response are not taken into account in the results. Uh, this is a very, very good introduction for our, to our last, uh, our next speaker, uh, Jua um, Kulmala. So I will introduce him now. Uh, he, Jua is from the Finnish uh, Road Safety Agency. Um, he will uh, introduce him himself better, but I can say that uh, Joa is an inspector working with quality and development among, among driver training and driver examination. So Joa, uh, what can you tell us about uh, motorcyclist behavior? So hello everyone from Helsinki, Finland. So, so, and thanks a lot about invitating me to this event. So, as we heard before, the human factor is very important when we speak about motorcycle safety. So,
So I'll tell you some things about motorcycle training and examinations for beginners and training also the motorists that are not novice drivers anymore. So many goal, goals for the training and education. We have to train, train new uh, beginners uh, all the knowledge that we know, know uh, from the motorcycles, what is safe and what is not. Skills uh, for the uh, motorcycling life, handling and all the skills that you need uh, in, in traffic when you drive safely with a motorcycle. And the most important thing that we, we must learn, learn and, and teach is the attitude. What uh, do we think about motorcycling? What is the goal of the motorcycling? And one uh, very important thing is that every motorcyclist, me among others, must be realistic uh, when we think about our skills. So it's a uh, long process to be a safe motorcyclist. First you take a course to get a license, but then you train yourself and get more training and and learning experiences and try to be be safe after those. And if we want to be safe mot motorcyclists, so one of the most important thing for for instructor is to motivate people to de develop themselves as drivers. So get more training and and especially here in in when we are in Finland, here in in, in north northern parts of Europe. So we have uh, two seasons. The season that we drive maybe five or six months a year and then, then we have the off season. So um, every spring we are all motorcycle drivers here. We are kind of beginners at the, at the spring time. So we have to train, train and, and think about all the things that belong to safety. And good goals uh, for driver training in, in every class is, is uh, or are safety and social interaction because we are not alone over there. There are a lot of others, a lot of other drivers and pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, all the others. And also ecology. Noise is one thing. Uh, when we talk about motorcycles and we should uh, uh, reduce noise and and also pollution with, with motorcycles, motorcycle driving. Okay, first uh, handling, handling exercises, then driving in traffic with your instructor and, and learn the safe way to do it. And one important thing is that, uh, like I said, it is a long process, so you get more experience and you always have to think and assess uh, your actions in, in traffic, so to, to be a more, better motorcyclist. And linking, uh, when we talk about learning, it's, it's very important, so we all have our earlier experiences of, of traffic and driving and actions of others in, in, in traffic. So we have to link our uh, new things for the older ones. So it's easier to understand when, when you start with, with motorcycling. Uh, and one important principle is also that for an instructor that uh, students uh, differ a lot, so it's always an individual process. Where are we starting? Which kind of uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes one have when when he or she starts motorcycling? 
and more or less uh, we should uh, get away from teaching to coaching so make it possible to learn not only lecture and and tell how it is just to discuss and and coach uh, the learner towards uh, right position uh, maybe the most uh, important assessments uh, are the ones that the learner does for himself or herself and also to get the f feedback from his instructor and and examiner okay uh, topics for the uh, training of beginners responsibility is a very important thing uh, for yourself for others for your vehicle your motorcycle that it is in good condition and, and your gear that you have it on your helmet strap tightened and all the other uh, parts of the gear that you can use jackets trousers gloves and all that so what's so special for motorcycles so as we heard earlier uh, it's a little thing in the traffic much more little than than a car so it makes a problem for other drivers to see a motorcyclist so you have to be very careful all the times it's fast it accelerates fast so others are not so used to do these things when they drive their cars and and everything else there in traffic especially here in Finland when we have that off season so drivers of cars maybe we can't remember that we are with other motorcycles also there at the springtime and and summer time risks the outer and uh, most important the inner risks so I think uh, motorcycling it's it's a mind game so you have to think what, what what do you think about motorcycling what are your motives what do you think of life what is the most important things what are the most important things for for you motorcycling is good fun but it's riskful as we have seen seen in the statistics so we have to be careful so you have to take care of your your motorcycle so it's it's fit for for driving don't for, forget the maintenance it's very important that brakes work when you need them and and so on always to think about driver condition are you are you tired do you have any medication drugs alcohol all this you have to be very careful and concentrate on driving when when you are driving with your motorcycle and as i told uh, active and passive safety gear using and also these uh, fine new motorcycles help when we have abs brakes traction control ITS things related things and all these Helping, helping in both both ways, active and passive. Observation: You have to look everywhere, be prepared of mistakes that other drivers do. Of course, we motorcyclists also make mistakes, so it's it's very important to make good observations. Think about your speed, driving speed. Uh, so it affects so many things how can you see others how can others cope with you uh, breaking distances and consequences after after an accident the speed affects them a lot and uh, visibility for a motorcyclist it's it's not maybe good enough so your gear colors helps always use your your lights 
as we heard, they come from the motorcycle nowadays, so it helps, but always make yourself visible. And locate, locate yourself in the traffic so that others can see you, can anticipate your moves and, and everything. And be always defensive, so don't trust too much on others that are on, on the next lane or, or in the same junction driving with you. Be defensive. So, some words about driver examination here in Finland. So, it, it's in, in three parts. First, theory test, then handling test, and driving test in traffic. And in, in theory test, we have 30 questions, pictures uh, with questions, yes or no. Uh, can you do something? Do you have to give way for, for someone? Pictures like that. And then uh, ten questions for for motorcycling, like cycling. What is safe? What is not? And in in handling test, we have six tasks. Uh, slow driving part uh, with slow driving straight and and slow driving slalom uh, and in in a very very slow slow speed. Then we have stop and go, which is it's it's braking, and then you immediate, immediately uh, start driving again. And braking task, so you may make a safe emergency brake. And avoidance task, where you avoid an obstacle, and then curves. And one problem is that these are made in uh, such slow speeds, so we should have bigger speeds, but the areas are not not so big that we use for for this test. So, so the main problem is that we should use uh, bigger speeds, but it's a good test both whole. And then a driving test about 25 minutes of driving in various situations in traffic. And maybe the most important part from your driving examination is the feedback assessment that you get from your examiner. What are the good things in, in your driving and then the things that you have to develop. And then training um, motorcyclists that have some experience. The idea of progressive access, like like from the uh, third uh, driving license uh, directive. So first start with a lighter motorcycle and then progressively go to uh, bigger motorcycles. Responsibility again, and uh, something that is very useful we have we have used is is that uh, yeah, we think about accidents, what what have happened, some cases, and then then make group discussions of them. What can we learn about them? Not to get in accidents like that uh, anymore. Demonstrations, maybe an instructor saw something, maybe a good emergency braking, or or something, something like that. And maybe the most uh, important thing in in training, when you train handling skills, uh, is to make it possible to fail, fail in a task, so that you don't think that you are yes are a good. Good uh, motorcyclist, motorcyclist when when you can handle your motorcycle quite well, but when you fail, you must uh, think about it. It's not easy. It it makes a lot of you have to make a lot of effort to uh, handle your motorcycle safely. 
and always when we uh, speak about GDE metrics, so we have to get towards upper levels. What are your goals in life? What are your goals for your motorcycling? What can you do to be a safer motorcyclist? Okay, that was my part and thank you for listening and and you can make questions for me and others. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Yua. It was very interesting. Um, we've had a question for you, but uh, we will respond to him. You, you, you will respond to him at the end of this workshop, as uh, the time is advancing quite uh, quickly. Uh, we have now the results of our last poll. So it's quite interesting, I think, because uh, when we ask you um, which are the greatest challenges faced by motorcyclists, in terms of road safety, really um, most of you respond to raise awareness of car drivers and to adapt a safer driving culture among motorcyclists. So I think it's uh, it's interesting to see that uh, you are not so much focused on infrastructure or on vehicles, but more on the behavior of both driver, car drivers and uh, motorcyclists. Um, I will now introduce our last speaker for today. And uh, this is John Chatterton Rose, uh, you're the director of EU Public Affairs in FIM, the International uh, Federation of Motorcyclists. I think your federation is uh, carrying out a lot of activities uh, to improve road safety of your users. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to give a little narrow range really on some of the things that are more connected with our sporting activities where we are trying to relate the two to, to, to road safety. And I noted a question from Southern Europe, so if we can um, start off with that. Uh, the next slide please, yes. This is a campaign um, in the island of Crete uh, and it is related to crash helmets. Uh, and there's a very specific reason for this. We're very interested in trying to get some really big wins, get the numbers of casualties down. And we know very well that there are helmet laws across the whole of the 27 states of the European Union, but they're not followed in every single place. So the partners here, uh, uh, the originators of the campaign, are obviously in Greece, the FIA Foundation and ourselves. Um, the FIA Foundation have a particular interest in this because they are uh, campaigning for helmet use uh, worldwide and they regard Crete as a, 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 a very good example because we can do some really detailed study as it's within an island uh, setting. Now, the purpose of this is not to confront those people who don't do as they should do, but to identify, and this was done with the help of teams of volunteers, riders who do the right thing. So I put it there quite clearly, wear the crash helmet and do up the strap. And then in exchange for that, uh, we arrange media coverage uh, and a monthly draw so that people who were identified, we got their email addresses and uh, it was a, a monthly draw and they could win a new helmet from AGV, one of the sponsors. And then at the end of the year, a grand prize, which was an all expenses paid trip to a MotoGP race. You can imagine, we got some pretty nice uh, coverage back in Crete. Uh, the winners could hardly believe, oh yes, it's nice to have a ticket to go to a MotoGP, but I can never afford to go. No, you don't worry. All the airfares, the hotel and the, and the reception is, is covered. So that's, that's just an example of, of one small campaign. And in concluding on this particular one, one of the reasons for this is our membership of the European Transport Safety Council. And they've said it's about time we got back to some of the basics like seat belts and helmets because we imagine we've solved these problems when in fact we haven't. Uh, and that is sort of summarized on this next slide. Uh, it's the culture that needs changing. Enforcement alone is not enough. Um, there are weaknesses in the enforcement that, as well and maybe there are things that we can do about that so with some, maybe some peer mentoring from one police force to another. Uh, that's something that we will look at with the partners next year. Other priorities in road safety already been mentioned. Um, 
low-cost infrastructure improvements. Um, the improvements to motorcyclist safety with roadside barriers is very much pioneered in Spain. A particular mention, I have to say, this is not something that FIM can take credit for. This is uh, an independent uh, organization in Norway, a member of uh, FEMA, another motorcycling organization based here in Brussels, and MCU, um, where working with the government and highway engineers, they've uh, sought to introduce the safe system of roads, specifically relating it to motorcycle safety on part of the road system in Norway. Is an excellent example of good practice. Um, training priorities, they've already been mentioned. Um, and as I need to mention earlier, um, the increased use of advanced braking systems, particularly anti lock braking systems on many more motorcycles and scooters. That's great, and we applaud the industry and the legislators for doing that. But we don't believe that we will get the full benefit of this until we take account of improving road safety. Uh, training is at the moment the kind of emergency stop you do when you practice emergency stops is pretty low speed stuff. With this modern technology, the anti lock braking system, you can start training on the training grounds at much higher emergency uh, braking uh, speeds. Um, we also use the sport as a as a platform for um, road safety projects. Um, the Rosa project. Uh, um, was hosted at uh, a number of um, MotoGP races, so that was a nice place for the road engineers to come and do their conferencing, and also the opportunity to engage directly with spectators at these events. Um, just very quickly, when we were uh, working with other partners to, to plan the ROSA project, uh, these are the figures from 2009, and you can see um, the relevant one here is 2.3 million people attend uh, MotoGP events. That spectators actually come to the race circuits. The TV audience is obviously much bigger. Okay. World champions as role models. This is uh, the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Uh, yellow badges, you can see. I'm ashamed I should have put mine on this morning. Um, uh, on the right is uh, Christian Saron. Um, former motorcycle world champion uh, from France, very active working with young people in France, a very uh, uh, articulate spokesman. And on the left there is a uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, MEP, uh, Wynne van der Kamp. So, you know, why do we use some of our sports stars as role models? It's not a job that every ex sports star or current sports star wants to do. People have different uh, skills and attitudes. But in the case of really exceptional personalities like Christian, um, he can engage very effectively uh, with uh, good politicians. Um, and it's interesting for them to meet a guy who's a, a world champion. And uh, the FIM Road Safety Award. Oh, it's very Spanish this morning. <laughs> yes, this is the second winner uh, uh, from last year, Andres Perez Rubio, very well known in Spain for his uh, uh, work, as I mentioned, on low cost infrastructure uh, on the safety barriers and also with the ROSA project that I mentioned earlier. Um, we're coming up to the third edition. It's a secret, so I'm not going to tell you who's won this year's award, but they will be uh, presented with it at a grand ceremony in Monaco, uh, alongside the world champions of sport when they get their award. The road safety uh, uh, winner gets their award as well, uh, and this will be televised. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this this is just about the TV for the final gala ceremony. Um, next slide, please. And again, you can see the uh, the, the very large number of um, uh, countries that will receive this broadcast. Um, finally, all of the above and more. Um, uh, sports skills, we believe, uh, can be used to improve road safety. And so this is using sport, but it's actually funny. It's difficult to describe because it's actually nothing to do with sport. If we go to the next slide, uh, I think it. These guys are not off-road racing people. They are ordinary street riders who are doing a little bit of very gentle off-road riding, so that when stuff happens back on the road, they won't be so surprised by it. Uh, because you can do things at low speed very, very safely here. If you look at the third rider there. He's got the wheels sliding really well uh, on the gravel there. Um, it's going to be far less frightening if, in an emergency, the back wheel slides a little bit. You realize there's nothing to panic about if you've done some of this training. 
And it's no surprise that professional police officers, uh, when they're training to ride motorcycles, they will often have part of their, their course here doing a bit of off-road work. Um, having said all that, this, as you look at it, you would think that's a racetrack. Um, well, it isn't. It's a magnificent road safety facility. It's just for the training of car drivers and motorcycle riders. Um, and this is going to be the uh, the venue of our next major FIM road, tra uh, road safety event next year at uh, Stockholm in Sweden. Um, so you've got, on the outside, it looks a little bit like a racetrack. But then on the inside, you've got sections which replicate the conditions out on the road. Um, you know, roundabouts, junctions, and so on. So in perfect safety there, you can develop uh, skills. And literally tens and tens of thousands of Swedish riders go there because um, rider training has become the sexy, fashionable thing to do in Sweden. Everybody wants to do it. Um, a few tricks have been played, like removing the word road safety and calling it SMC school or cornering school or other things. But uh, anyway, we think that's going to be a great venue for, for three days. Um, and the last slide. Uh, as I've explained, not a not a track, um, but a, a specific venue. And if you need to know more, uh, here are my contact details. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John, for this uh, presentation. I think it has been very complementary with the presentation before. Um, now uh, we have a, a few minutes for questions. Before this, I will uh, I will present the result of our last um, poll. And so, Nicolas. Uh, so we've seen that um, most of you have responded um, the D response. So you think that uh, the, all the all the different uh, activities could be useful to promote road safety. Thank you for having uh, responded to all those uh, polls. Um, now I will uh, um, introduce uh, Nicolas that will tell us a little bit of what happened as has happened on the chat section during our, uh, our workshop. So Nicolas, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Hello everyone. Um, I have some questions from some of you towards the speakers. Uh, I'll begin with this one. Uh, to what? Expand. Do you believe road marking and road signaling influence road safety? Yes, I, I, I think the, the the road structure itself informs a great deal of behaviour. So a safe system road, um, where it's clear that this is a residential area and everything is marked in the right way, has a psychological effect, a definite effect on the. Uh, on the way in which um, road users behave. Uh, I think this is a uh, well proven. You see very good examples of it in the Netherlands, for example. Okay, thank you. And one more question for Veneta this time. Uh, what about the situation in countries in, in southern Europe where, due to better weather conditions, the problem of fatalities from power two wheelers is greater? Is there a more targeted effort? Yeah, this is a very interesting question, but uh, we know also that the user behavior is also has some cultural uh, element, and we all know that the road safety in general is uh, not uh, at this good level as in Western European countries, and maybe the good climate is also contributing to this. It is also true that some of the moped and motorcycle riders are not uh, willing to wear helmets and protective equipment exactly due to the fact that it is uh, quite hot in, in these countries. But uh, once more, I would like to underline that um, the industry is producing the same vehicles. So we have the same vehicles all over Europe. But despite this fact, we have very different results in terms of safety. And once more, this is very important that all major players should uh, join forces to improve PTW safety. And we could not expect that the PTW in industry could do it alone. So we really 
would like to invite all stakeholders uh, to work together to improve PTW safety. Thank you very much for those uh, two responses. Um, if you have other other questions, feel free to post them. Oh, no, sorry, there's one more question. So, Nicolas, can you? I think the the next question is for John. It was regarding the the campaign in Crete, and the question is, uh, what was the budget for this campaign, and if there's a possibility of, of developing countrywide campaigns uh, similar to this one? Answer the question on the budget off the top of my head, um, but this uh, campaign is is not an isolated one. Um, the purpose of the Creek campaign was to go more in depth on this kind of work to see what we could learn and validate it. Uh, the original campaign uh, on the helmet wearing comes from Vietnam, um, where uh, allied to enforcement and the new availability of a tropical crash helmet, Vietnam has seen more than a one third reduction in uh, fatalities. Uh, so our view is if this can be done in a Southeast Asian nation, uh, like uh, Vietnam, it can be replicated in, in other parts of the world with similar economic conditions. Um, and that's why Crete was chosen, because there's a bit of a crossover between Crete and other parts of the world, in the sense that it's a very, very beautiful place, but also it has quite difficult infrastructure. It's one of the reasons why tourists go there, because the roads are so beautiful. Um, but uh, whoever's asking, um, feel free to email me, and we, we can talk much more about this. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we are arriving at the end of this uh, webinar. I think this has been very instructive. Um, thank you for being uh, within the public. Thank you for uh, to our um, four panelists, four speakers, and three of them being with me here, and you are from Finland. Um, all the presentations that have been shown today will be in our website, so don't hesitate to join us in uh, erscharter.eu. Well, you are joining us also here, you can uh, take advantage to ask for more questions, and we will try to respond to you as much as possible, and we are still in contact with our speakers, so it will be interesting to make a follow-up of this workshop. Um, if you um, join our website, please take advantage uh, to participate to our Facebook campaign, which is a, a, Facebook, a campaign that we are making towards citizens uh, to make sure that uh, road safety uh, is not forgotten uh, in the in the next months by uh, nobody. So we are looking for people to um, take the pledge for road safety. Um, now. Um, I will just have to remind you that uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock Central Europe time uh, we will have our next webinar about training and how to optimize training programs and then uh, just uh, we, we are sorry we've had to postpone for the reason of the availability of one of our speakers our webinar on media um, and road safety, but this will take place at the start of December. As soon as we have a final date, we will write personally to all the people that have registered for this webinar to uh, indicate the new date. Well, thank you again for your attention. Thank you for your participation, and uh, see you uh, in uh, two hours for the ones that have registered for the following uh, webinar. <laughs>